Welcome JRPG fans to The Shining Retrospective, a deep dive into Sega's long-standing series of games that's names start with Shining. This series is probably best known for the tactics games Shining Force, or even the modern action RPGs Shining Resonance, but we're going way back to the very beginning with this one. The place where it all started though was Shining in the Darkness. This was actually a first person dungeon crawl, a gameplay type that we wouldn't see again for a while is the brainchild of Hiroyuki Takahashi and his brother. Leading up to the Shining series development, Takahashi worked on multiple Dragon Quest titles under Enix and was looking for a new challenge and he found himself at Sega's door, being offered to lead a team called Sega CD4, which quickly changed its name to Sonic Software Planning and even more recently it's now called Camelot and Takahashi is still the lead as president. Uh, he was charged with creating a new game as well as using his background in RPGs, he felt it was time to create his own. Grabbing his brother and his friend Hiroshi Naito, sorry about the pronunciation, uh, who led at the time Climax Entertainment, also a new company, they set out together to make Takahashi's vision come true. For both teams involved, this was going to be their first game under the Sega umbrella, and technically, while they both had experience, they were considered untested by Sega. At first, this wasn't an, an issue, and Sega was being very supportive, but due to a management shift, the support seemed to diminish somewhat, unless they didn't quite receive as much financially and such as they hoped, given the history and experience they'd brought with them. But I can somewhat appreciate Sega's point of view if we played Devil's Advocate, uh, even if I wish they hadn't gone this way, as I didn't want to commit heavily financially to these untested teams. But this treatment would sow the first seed to the future drama to come between the two companies. But onto the game itself. Takahashi had this dream, and while he wasn't able to fully realise it, he did his best. And this was the dream he stated in an interview. Because we were on touch a tight budget, apart from programming and graphics, I did nearly all of the work on Shining in the Darkness. I suppose the basic concept behind Darkness was realism. I thought it'd be exciting if the player could actually travel to a fantasy world and walk around, exploring old houses, dungeons and other places. It was in an essence a continuation of the sense of excitement you'd get from moving through the dungeons in older games such as Wizardry. And by reality, I'm not talking about true realism, I mean the feeling that you are really progressing through an actual house and dungeons, and the same thing applied to the battles. Now, personally I don't think he quite reached that level of realism as you'll see, and considering the age of the games. But he did build an intriguing world, and the first game in a long-standing series that build on each other, kind of. This was the world in the country of Thornwood, in which he had three places, the castle, where most of the story beats are, the town, which acts as a hub, has a lot of the comedy elements and such, and the labyrinth, where the meat of the game takes place. Each of these places is filled with colourful cast of characters, rendering it in pretty good graphics considering the age of the game. And the Labyrinth has many interestingly designed enemies, sadly not as many as Takashi wanted as the budget etc. caused them to have to do a lot of pilot swaps for the enemies. But anyway, we're going to talk about the story for now, and I'm going to go to spoilers, so if you want to skip to the talk on gameplay and such, please jump to this time. You've been warned, so here we go. Story. The story opens in the main castle of the country of Thornwood, where you've been summoned, you being a young knight of the kingdom. You've been specifically asked what the princess is missing, and the last person she'd seen with was Mortred, your father, who is simply missing. You've been recommended by one of the king's advisors, Tristan, who is an old knight and a friend of your father, but the others, especially Lord Viren, is suspicious of you and the circumstances, considering it's your father that the princess has gone missing with, but the king is willing to give you a chance. He gives you some money to get some equipment from the town, and off you go. In the town, you meet the colourful cast of residents that make it up, and there are such people as the friendly elves Di and Diane, and their carer Edward, and some others that are not so friendly and suspicious of your father. With a new set of equipment you've bought from the, the town, you head off back to the castle to get your orders, but suddenly a figure appears and showing massive power sending the Night King and advisors into disarray. This figure is Dark Soul, the main antagonist. He announces that the princess is in the nearby labyrinth, and if you want to see her alive, then you must challenge this dangerous place. So, being the noble hero that we are, into the labyrinth we go. 
It definitely lives up to its name, Labyrinth, with its twisting corridors, traps and monsters. No doubt, on your first entering, you'll suffer several defeats before gaining the necessary experience to survive. The Labyrinth teaches you through a simple process of defeat. Grow stronger, memorise the map, memorise the enemies, and die again when you meet the next new ones. This loop is the loop that will be going throughout the entire game, and through it, you'll grow stronger and learn to survive. Not long after searching through the initial floor, you come across your first boss, the Kaiser Crab, a frothing mouthed giant crab that scuttles out of nowhere to impede your progress. And well, if you haven't grown strong enough, you will die, because you look like a tasty little morsel. But if you defeat him and get yourself some nice uh, crab legs to take back to the town and eat, that's not actually an item by the way, you acquire the Royal Tiara. Using this as an excuse to flee the labyrinth, you return to the king, who informs you that this is the tiara he gave his daughter when she was 12, confirming that Dark Soul did not lie about kidnapping her. But to progress, you can't do this alone, because the trials will only get harder and harder. The advisor, Melville and Theos, inform you about the four trials of the labyrinth that Nice must pass to be able to enter the upper floors proper, which is likely where the princess is being held. So off to the town we go. Inside the tavern, we find a young girl arguing with old Vic, the tavern owner. This is our introduction to the crazy aggressive mage, sorry magic user, from a fire line of elves, of our party, Pyra. Next stop is the shrine, but just outside the tavern, Gila the Mercery bumps into Pyra, and she shows her personality, she ain't letting this go. As he walks off towards the labyrinth, she casts slow on him. This isn't going to be a problem for him, surely, poor Gila. At the shrine, we collect our mighty warrior monk, Milo who just looks depressed about it all. But back to the castle with everyone in tow, uh, with our legendary party, to collect the Dwarf Key, the item that will allow us entry to the so-called Trials. If you pop back to the tavern before heading off um, into the labyrinth, you find out that the young elf knight Dai are set off for the Trials as well, along with all the other knights of the kingdom that are under Viren, because he doesn't trust you. And why should he? Your father's the one who lost the princess after all. But poor Dai's sister is worried about his safety. So if we ever see him, let's, uh, let's be sure to rescue him. So off we go with our teammates in tow to challenge the trials and prove ourselves true knights. The first of the trials is the trial of strength. As the uh, name implies, we'll need to smash our way through. The following trials are the trial of courage, truth and wisdom. But strength is first. Halfway through this trial, we find Pyra's little friend, Gila, who is struggling for some unknown reason. <laughs> Pyra. <laughs> Completing the first trial, we can now enter the second cave of courage, but first we've got to drop Gila back at the town, and he informs us the only reason they've gone in was for the Orb of Truth. The, the item name suggests it's able to show all truths. In this case, it uh, reveals hidden walls and such. The second trial, according to the King's Advisor, is the Bane of Magic Users, and we'll soon find out why, as this cave has the slime tiles floor effect that removes one of our precious MP for every step we walk in, and considering we don't have much MP at this point in time, it's a bit of a pain. But overall, it isn't particularly complicated, but we do face our second boss monster, the Tortodile, a giant eggshell tortoise thing. That on defeating, we gain the legendary Orb of Truth, sucks to be you, Gila. And thus, we have defeated the second trial, the Trial of Courage. Back at the tavern, Lupo, one of the denizens of the, the tavern, is amazed that we have the Orb of Truth. Diane is lamenting her brother still, imagining that his very bones are being gnawed on by monsters. Have a little faith, Diane. Back in the labyrinth, we go to a strange looking wall on the first floor that we'd previously come across. Using the Orb of Truth, we discover it's a grim wall, a monster that we need to defeat, and upon doing so, we have more access to the first floor. The map is far larger than we first thought. And eventually we come across the entrance to the Trial of Truth. The cave doesn't offer much in new terms of challenge, but you do find Yasser, the princess. She's locked in a cell. It seems our adventure isn't as difficult as we thought it was going to be. We found her, and she informs us she just needs a key to open up the cell. So off we head off to find the key. When we do, we return and unlock it. And then something horrible happens. Jessa transforms before our eyes into the Doppler. So yeah, it wasn't the princess. She's in another castle. Defeating the Doppler grants us the room key and the access to the next trial. So off we go, make a quick detour to the castle to find out the last trial is the trial of wisdom, 
and Viren only has one knight left still standing. Um, it seems that we are doing the best out of everyone. So hopefully we come across this one knight. This trial feels bigger than the previous ones and has a bunch of um, interesting elements such as pitfalls, walls dropping from the ceiling, spinny floors, and enemies with D-Sol. D-Sol, if you're wondering, is Shining Series spell that is instant kill, and it's surprisingly effective and accurate in this game. So, after wandering around, you eventually come across a familiar face, the Last Knight, and he screams in your face, fearing you to be a monster. It's Dai, the elf from the tavern. He survived so far, so he must be the greatest of the knights under Viren. So dragging him in tow, you deliver him back at his sister, and she couldn't be happier to see her brother alive. So back into the trial, we survive to the exit, and we've proven ourselves to be true knights. So we head off to see the king to discuss after entering the labyrinth proper. Theos tells you that the labyrinth has five floors in all, ignoring the trials. You know that means you're probably visiting all of them, but among them you notice one person is missing. Melville. We're heading back in the labyrinth, stopping off the tavern, we get a special scene that gives us a hint into our companions' personalities, as you get to meet Mr. Brax and Mrs. Mist, who are our companions' parents, who are rather miffed at their children running into danger without informing them. And while Miss Mist's nature isn't too different to a child, as she starts giving Pyra a good spanking until good old Vic calms her down. This is the mighty true knight that's just conquered the trials of the labyrinth and she's getting beaten by a parent. Well, after this, a new fancy shop opens up in town, so we can now use all that mithril and dark ore we find to create nice, shiny weapons. Floor two and three are not particularly special. They're just much more of what we've seen before. But if you go back to the castle at the, the end of floor two, you get to meet Zern, Melville's mentor, who gives us a very useful item called the medallion, which can be split into two, place it in the fountains so we can teleport backwards and forwards. I mean, we literally just teleport straight to a floor where we put medallion, but don't forget to collect it when moving up to the next floor, which does require some backtracking, but hey, it's useful. Um, but if you go to the tavern as well at this point, Melville reveals his true nature. Melville is Dark Soul. And at the end of floor three, we get the next boss, Blackbone. He's a giant skeletal physical monster, not too difficult. But back at the castle, Dark Soul strikes battling Zern, who is easily defeated. He turns to the king and asks if he has more champions to face him. He even mentions your dad, Mordred, but it feels vaguely ominous when he does. He then turns to you and asks you to join him, which you give him just a blank stare. And your response, or well, lack thereof, says he'll see you in the labyrinth, knowing that you're going to fight. The king and the counselors are left in despair, with Zern lamenting, even the arms of light, mythical weapons, may not be strong enough. The emotions keep flowing on fourth floor, as you do find the princess, the real Princess Jess at this time. It informs you that you need to find a cell key again, but it's guarded by Mortred. Mortred, who is no longer on our side. And so begins a battle between son and corrupted father. Defeating him, you finally release the darkness that has taken hold of your father. And he tells you not to be sad, and now he can be at peace and you've truly invested in the battle as the corruption was caused by the darkness, sword of darkness given to Mortred by Melville, Dark Soul. With the princess in tow, you take the time to take her back to the castle. If you enter the town, it'll definitely give the local residents a fright to demand you to take her straight to the, the, uh, the castle as they're not worthy. Returning the princess raises the morale at the castle, and even Viren completely convinced by you. And you get told about the legend of the Shining Knight, a hero that can defeat the darkness. Floor 5 is the biggest challenge yet, as it ramps up the difficulty quite quickly. After some exploring, you come across a strange fainting, and you can't do anything with it. As you go back to the castle to find everyone mourning Mortred, as the princess has told everyone what happens, shedding a tear which Theos catches. You know that's a normal reaction, and the princess cries, you bottle it up obviously. He gives that tear to you, which so happens to be just what you need to activate the fountain. A spirit rises from it and blesses you, and the arms of light that you found through searching. You are now announced officially being the Shining Knight. We are now ready to, for our final battle with Dark Soul. Rising to the final floor, we find Dark Soul. He finally tells us his reasoning for what has been going on. He's bored. The ultimate power he's attained 
everything he can do, nothing challenges him anymore. So he's just become bored and wants to see if he could create a challenger. So, well, let's give him one and whoop his ass in this battle. On his defeat, he is stunned and calls out to the darkness for more power. Transforms into a true demon and round two begins. Unleashing everything we've had, we bring down the monstrosity, bringing, bringing light back to Thornwood. Doing a victory lap of the town, everyone's happy to have peace. Well, except for the weapon and armor shop that we've kind of just put out of business, it seems. At the castle, more merriment and shoes, with Viren even calling us a true knight. Finally, recognition from this, uh, this noble. The king gives us the title of Lord of Thornwood. Milo is my counsellor. Pyro is accepted as apprentice to Zern. Hopefully, she doesn't go the same path as Melville. Roll the end credit, where we see a kindly old man saying he'll see us again soon. Now, on to the gameplay. The gameplay in Shining in the Darkness isn't particularly complex, but it is the first time we see Camelot's menu system. The uh, little square boxes in, a, in like a diamond shape, which I couldn't find a name for. The menu system is very simple to use and it's quite versatile because selecting each item will open up the next menu in the same shape. And it's actually very quick to use as well. Um, being something that comes, this, this quickness is something that comes into affecting later Shining games as they could be very quick compared to their counterparts. So the game is a stereotypical turn based battle system which uh, each character basically being a part of statistics. In this case, we have hit points, you know, basically how much damage you can take before dying, magic points, how much magic you can use before running out. IQ, this is a strange stat that has a small effect on the characteristics, magic, breath, and status resistance. Speed, how quickly your character reacts. The higher the number, the more likely you are to go first. Luck, higher luck means you're more likely to crit or not get poisoned and the like. Attack. This is the character's unmodified attack strength. This gets adjusted by equipment and spells. Defense, being the same as attack, but for defense. So how much damage you can, like, resistance you have. Weapon factor, the sum of the character's attack and equipped weapon. This number is used to determine the actual damage done compared to monster's defense. So you take your weapon factor minus the monster's defense, and the difference is the damage. Armor factor is your defense. Um, and it's the other way around, obviously. So the, the system isn't particularly complicated to work out how much damage and such you'll do. Uh, each of the three characters has a slightly different stat growth, meaning on level up they're more likely to get more points in a stat. For example, our hero gets more attack than the others, Pyro gets more MP, um, and these leads each character down a certain route, so obviously the hero being a physical powerhouse, Pyro being the hardcore mage user, and Milo is kind of, Milo's kind of like a strangely a jack of all trades. Um, so yeah, like that that system isn't particularly complicated. You can literally work the maths out if you have like a walkthrough with the enemy statistics, your numbers in front of you and such. You can figure out what damage is going to happen, what you're going to do. Um, and the growth curves are pretty obvious very early on. You can see how fast like on a level up the hero might gain like three attack points the others get two and one so you can see how it's going to develop over many levels so on to other elements of gameplay so the castle doesn't have much in the way of gameplay beyond story beats but the town has many useful features such as weapons armor and item shop uh, all of these have special deals and they sell unique items which become unlocked as we go through and this is where you get rid of items because we have a limited storage capacity. Later on, we get a fourth item shop opening as well that allows us to create weapons using Mithril or Dark Ore. Dark Ore weapons being strong, but they're cursed. Um, curse being something that when you're equipped with one, you might not act that turn. So if you if you say give Pyra the, curse, the uh, Dark Whip, um, Sometimes she'll hit everyone and do a load of damage, and then every now and again she'll just do nothing. Uh, the Mithril tends to be some of the strongest weapons outside of certain special ones as well. So you'll find yourself, by the end, a lot of your characters will be equipped with Mithril armor types, um, Mithril weapons and such, because they, they are the best apart from the, the special, special stuff. Uh, there are some special weapons, obviously, um, such as the Arms of Light, and they have like special effects so like the fire sword can you can you you can actually use it as an item 
and it will cast a spell. Um, some of the rings you can use as an item. And they might cast like defensive spells or a heal. But they can break after multiple uses. So you have to take them back to the weapon shop to be repaired. So you kind of got this the loop of getting new equipment, fighting stronger enemies, breaking your weapons, coming back, repairing them, spending gold, upgrading your equipment, upgrading, finding new mithril. Oh, it's it's a lot of backwards and forth between the town and the labyrinth. The shrine in the town offers the ability to save your status elements and resurrect all the party members. So outside of say so basically when someone dies you probably just want to just get bail out of the uh, this the um, labyrinth and just heal everyone straight away because having being down to one or two party members is just crippling in this game um so you can also go to the tavern uh, the tavern has a lot of story beats in it but it also has a way to recover everyone's health for a small bit of gold it doesn't charge too much but the majority of the game will be spent in the labyrinth proper. Uh, this is presented in the first person dungeon crawl style, a la wizardry and such, um, of the yesteryear type games. It actually seems to have had a bit of a comeback more recently as well. Each floor is set on a grid style, so meaning pressing forward on the scroll moves one square forward. It's not like um, like an open world Skyrim esque, like as you walk, you can stop anywhere kind of thing. It's literally like you move one grid forward, one grid forward. Um, this does mean that traversal is very simple and you can literally use square paper to mark down the maps so as you go through you can make your own map very easily uh, there are some hazards in the game such as the MP absorbing tile which drains every party member of one MP holes that will drop you into other floors uh, falling walls which will block you as you go to step forward spinny tiles which spin you 720 degrees so you kind of have to work out where you want to go. Um, each of these are introduced one at a time until you get like a mix of them later in the game. But uh, overall, it's like it's not too complicated. You can quickly figure out how to navigate the spinny floors. Once you've dropped down a hole, you can, if you've been making your own little maps, you can easily mark those down. And sometimes you'll want to drop down them. You also get a rope later in the game, which allows you to climb back up. So you might find holes in the roof that you can use to get up to higher floors. Um, but obviously the biggest hazard in the game is the random encounters. So every step you take, there's a chance you'll be brought into battle with the monsters. Um, not every battle is random. There are some scripted encounters such as the bosses, the Kaiser Crab, but 95% of them will be a, you step onto a tile and blah, 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 you're in the battle. Which is kind of cool because it actually still keeps, like the background keeps the look of where you were supposed to you know like in a lot of games where you transition into a different stream completely this actually keeps you kind of in the map where you are so if there's a corner in front of you you'll see that in like the corner wall in front of you and such it's pretty cool so um but as always with random encounters make sure you keep an eye on your health because if you get caught off guard and die you'll lose half your money and be sent back to the shrine uh so yeah also with traversal we have the medallion um we have like i said the rope uh, and like the keys and such, which you have to just take up your limited inventory space. So you'll be um, selling those off and holding them and buying them back and such as you need them. Uh, but yeah, other than that, it's not particularly complex. But the dungeon designs themselves, the layouts, do take some memorizing. But they're not too, so complex that you can't memorize them, which is nice. Gets your brain juices flowing, but it isn't completely ridiculous. So the battles themselves are, are again, aren't a complex affair. There, we, we have a limited number of options. You'll be facing against a bunch of monsters that can be divided into enemy groups. Each group contains several monsters with a chance of multiple groups. And then you have the ability to hit single target, like a single enemy. You can hit enemy group, or you can hit the entire, all groups of enemies. Uh, everyone get based, gets to act based on a hidden turn order that is this defined by your speed stat. The higher the number, obviously the earlier you would go. And then they're working down this order with um, people with similar speed stats being like random. And then you have your obviously basic attack, which is just a straight up physical hit. Defend, which 
you won't do any action, but you'll take reduced damage. So if you can see anyone winding up for a big attack, you'll defend. Um, you can cast a spell, or use an item, or you can run away. Um, and you keep going until one side is dead. Basically like every turn-based system over here. So yeah, not that complicated. Even though the game isn't very complex, it's not particularly easy. As, as with a lot of dungeon crawlers, which it takes inspiration from, um, it can be a bit of a brutal affair, like quite a high random encounter rate. And especially very, very early on when you're by yourself, it's very easy to die. And a single miss, a uh, single, if you're using a cursed weapon, stops you attacking. Um, a critical enemy using a D soul and just wipe you. And just like straight up, that's it. Your entire run for that labyrinth run is done. Um, add on to that, MP is a very valuable resource, um, especially early on, because you want to be using your items to heal, but you've only got limited item space. So you want to rely on your healing, but you also want to be able to use your healing, your, your spells. Do damage so that management is very important and if you get it wrong and you're suddenly MP screwed especially if you now have to walk over an area with the, uh, the slime MP reducing tiles you can find yourself coming out the other side just not being able to continue and having to get the hell out of dodge um, magic is pretty cool so other than healing it has multiple uses that are pretty simple so we've got a bunch of like attack spells so they start off usually a single target uh, and they grow to hit multiple targets and then tend to be like the, the third or fourth level hits everyone um, we have aggress which teleports us out of the labyrinth which is really useful we have view that lets you see the map um, peace that will stop weak enemies from attacking you so if you're trying to do something in a lower level dungeon you might cast peace a lot uh, muddle screen sleep which cause various status effects sleep being particularly a good one as it costs six mp you can put most of the enemies to sleep giving you free attacks on them with your big physical hitter so it's actually cheaper than using some of the higher level spells <laughs> to do damage instead just rely on your hero to kill them while they're asleep um quick and boost are used liberally as they buff your party's party speed and damage so you do get ones that target the whole group but sometimes it might just be you want to boost your hero so he hits like a truck uh, but yeah it's again it's all about the management of those spells and they have some pretty fancy spell effects as they go off as well especially for the considering the era uh, and it could be the difference between needing to do lots of little runs with many trips and spending hours grinding to using it like using your MP effectively, absolutely blitzing the floor an entire go. Um, alongside the magic, obviously ensuring your gear is up to scratch is also important, as having the latest and best stuff means that your damage is higher and your defense is better, and you're more able to survive, especially some of the um, magical equipment that has like extra abilities, so being able to use like the, the ring of he the, the ring that gives you healing to heal yourself, as opposed to using your MP or an item until it breaks is, is great but yeah so it's not the most complicated game but it will pan you for not thinking about it so plan your plan your runs think about what you're doing think about your equipment how you're going to use your spells and you'll see the end of the labyrinth so the next bit i'm going to always try and talk about any ports and such but this game hasn't really received any remakes it kind of has been ported to other consoles other than the Mega Drive, where it was um, an exclusive originally. Uh, it's usually part, you find it's part of like Mega Drive collections, um, such as on the Switch, PS4, PC, so it's quite easy to get hold of if you want to go buy those collections, or I think on Steam you can buy them individually if you don't own the original copy on Mega Drive. But it's not particularly a rare game, so finding it isn't like on eBay and such isn't that hard. But yeah, I've, I've been intrigued to see a remake of this game, I'm not going to lie. It's interesting to see what they do with it. But yeah. So my final verdict for me, um, I'm always going to be a bit biased to this game. Because for me, this was my first ever JRPG I ever owned or played. I had no idea what I was doing when I first did it. But it, the game hooked me. I didn't even know what like RPG 
stood for, let alone JRPG. And it, because of that, it's, it led me down the path that I've taken in my gaming, where I've played so many JRPGs and such, so there is bias there. This is like full nostalgia for me. Um, the game itself, I'm willing to admit, is a little rough around the edges. Obviously, as I said at the start, it didn't get the budget it wanted. Um, there's lots of reskins of enemies, so you'll see the same enemy but just a different colour, um, which can feel repetitive and such. And then the bloody insta death spells as well, <laughs> being so effective. But yeah, I've always felt that most of these are kind of like little nitpicks. And the game itself, I, I really think, is a great game, especially if you've never tried Dungeon Crawlers before. I feel it's a really good introduction to it. The story and gameplay, while simple, do provide a challenge, which Dungeon Crawlers are known for, and they just keep you coming back for the next floor and the next floor. And it doesn't have some of the really obtuse systems that some of the other uh, Dungeon Crawlers have. Meaning there's a little bit no, a little bit less of the uh, BS, meaning it's just accessible. And overall, I think if you're into JRPGs, and if, maybe if you played the Shining Force games and seen this, it's worth a try. Like, I reckon most people would that like our sort of genre, the RPG genre, would enjoy it to some degree. But overall, I hope you enjoyed this first retrospective, and we'll be looking into more of the signing series and beyond hopefully in the future and see you again soon.